The history of a church is told by the buildings, the ministers, and the numbers in attendance, but it is really a story about the people. What drew them to the teachings of science of mind? How did they work together to build an organization with over 50 years of history? These doors open for us through the people who kept this vision alive. Revealed in the found documents, headlines of newspaper articles, and many faded photographs. It began as a study group of four in the late 50s. They met in the Spanish room of the El Palomar Hotel in downtown Santa Cruz. Eve Enns was there and she left a record of the early days. Eventually, a bigger space was needed and they rented the women's club on Mission Street where they continued to grow. A building what is now the Pacific Cultural Center was then purchased, but attendance fell off with a series of unsuccessful ministers and the building was lost. A core congregation of several women stayed together and through their fundraising efforts, they managed a down payment on a small facility on Pennsylvania Avenue. Dr. Elizabeth Bryce Reed was called as minister. She turned things around and served for nearly 20 years. But it was somewhere around 1965 when, when I, we first uh, started going to the, at that time it was Church of Religious Science mm -hmm. or Science of Mind. In uh, a few years, Reverend Reed became our new minister, and he went for her <laughs> gung-ho <laughs> because of her wry sense of humor. And she was wonderful. She pulled a lot of people to the church, and she was instrumental in getting us moved into a church, <laughs> a little church on Pennsylvania that we bought. I went to the first church of religious science when I was searching for a church to take my children to. I felt um, I wanted to have somewhere with a, a Sunday home. And so I had gone to lots of churches in a, in a few months time. Was very disappointed with most of them. And when my son, who at the time was five, came stomping out of a church and want, demanded to know what God was mad at him for, because he had done nothing to God. <laughs> I thought, okay, maybe, maybe church is not the answer. So I told my mom that I wasn't gonna take him to church. I didn't feel it was necessary. And she mentioned a church that she had been going to for a couple of years and none of us really knew it. Um, so she told me it was the Religious Science Church on Pennsylvania Avenue. And the minister there was uh, Reverend Elizabeth Bryce Reed. And we decided to try it. Oh, Reverend Reed, she was very special, a lot of fun. And she told great stories and she was a great speaker. She, uh, when I first came to the church uh, with my parents in July, they were singing Christmas carols. And my parents said, what kind of church is this? And she said, everybody says you should have the Christmas spirit throughout the year. Here we really do. And boy, they were, they were really taken with that. And so was I. It, it was always a, an event to go to church. <laughs> and I walked in there, and I cannot tell you how wonderful it was. It was, people were laughing and clapping. I was dragged, kicking and screaming, to this church by a friend who was a business associate as well as a friend, who, while I was going through some personal stuff, kept saying to me, you need to come with me to this little church and get a drink from the well of happiness or healing, whatever. And, I mean, and he, he did it so many times that I finally just said, okay, Don, 
get off my back, I'll come with you. So he took me to this little white church on Pennsylvania Avenue, and we went and we sat down, and there it seemed like there were a lot of friendly people there. The lady in front turned around and said, hello, and how are you, and smiled and everything. And then pretty soon, this little old lady came out from the back room, and she sat down at the organ and opened it up, and she started to play. The minute she started to play, I don't know what it was she was playing, I started with the tears. And they kept going during the whole service. Dr. Reed came out, and she spoke only to me, no one else. And I felt like someone had taken what I thought religion should be all about, and here it was. Well, Reverend Reed was a very special lady, of course. She had a great sense of humor uh, and uh, could make, be excited over almost any subject that, uh, uh, and, and uh, make you interested in it. Uh, she uh, talked uh, well. Uh, she uh, was very friendly. Very, I, I, I don't think I ever heard of anybody that didn't get along with her. When I first came into a religious science church, I was totally taken aback by how relaxed and laughing and smiling everybody was. All of the churches that I had been attending, trying so hard to find just the right one for my children and I, and my husband, um, they were so somber and judgmental and just downright, I, I, you left there feeling much worse than you ever did walking in. So that was one thing about religious science. I skipped out of that place. I was like, woohoo! And it was wonderful. Reverend Elizabeth Bryce Reed was somebody that once you knew her, it was just very hard to, um, to ever want to hear anybody else. I mean, there are wonderful speakers out there, but she had such a great sense of humor. She could relate daily life and religious science and put it all together. And when you walked out the door, you had a plan for the week. Reverend Reed was um, the kind of person that I didn't expect to see in a pulpit. First of all, she was a woman, and that was something that I was not used to. And second of all, the way she spoke was, I don't think, she, I don't think if she had notes, I don't think she ever looked at her notes. And it seemed like everything that she was saying was just for me. And of course, other people said the same thing. Um, one of the things, that two, there are two things that I remember from her that always brought a chuckle from the congregation. And one of those was, instead of saying, well, darn it anyway, or something like that, she would say, well, for crying in a bucket. I still use that expression. And she always ended her talks, her sermons with, now think on these things so that we would have been directed by her that when we left there, that that wasn't the end of it, that we were to take home what it was that she had told us about and talked to us about and think about them. And I thought that was really great. I loved her, I loved her to pieces. She was just so uplifting. You just really felt that the world, that the world was yours. And so she was a wonderful, wonderful um, minister. It was huge. It, she filled those seats every Sunday and until it got to be so full that we went into two services, which was nice for me because I could go to the first service and then the second service be in the junior church with the kids. They really learned to demonstrate things in their life, too. They, they learned the steps, and they, they did some amazing demonstrations. <laughs> Every holiday in uh, the year was celebrated in the biggest way possible there. We had big Halloween parties, and uh, everyone would come, even people we didn't know. <laughs> they, they were wonderful, and everybody participated. Another time, and I believe this was an annual thing. We would go to Diavolega Park and have a picnic. 
and just enjoy each other's company and play baseball and just all kinds of stuff to do, not just with the children, but the adults got very involved and it was big potlucks and I believe the church furnished, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs and it just, there was a lot of activity then. She was a great teacher. She, she was uh, a, the same as she was on Sunday. She could be very humorous and yet very serious and speak with the Christ authority and you listened and she was just very much a wonderful teacher. At the church in, uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue, I also took classes uh, that were about prosperity, abundance, um, getting along with difficult people. We had little books um, that uh, Dr. Reed would work out of. And I remember um, Jack Holland had written a book and he came and spoke and Lloyd Tupper came and spoke. And so we had a lot of classes then too, just um, again, much as we do here now. And it's, it, it, that has been very rewarding having taken those and it has really helped me in my, in my entire life. Walter Reed, Elizabeth's husband, was the nicest man and he had had a, a really good Hollywood career. They had lived in Southern California for quite some time while he was working. But he was always at the door greeting people when we would arrive on Sunday. Um, when Dr. Reed would be at the door as we were leaving, he would be right there with her and, and welcoming or telling people have a great week and shaking their hands and hugging them. And he was really great, too, with even the kids. Probably more uh, B, B movies, uh, as, not as the, 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 the lead, but as backups and special characters and so on. And he ended up uh, getting quite some awards at that, and one of them being that down at the Nickelodeon, he has his uh, finger, his handprints there in the in the cement looks like they do down in LA where those things are mean something. Well, you felt loved by both of them. There was just a, a feeling of just pure love when you were around Walter and, and Elizabeth. They just were great, great people. They did have a full-time secretary, but the practitioners were vital at that point, as they always are, in helping to keep the church running smoothly and helping Dr. Reed with um, house calls or and just counseling people who needed it. But you always felt you could go to them for anything. Getting the newsletter from the church, they always were talking about Gwen Lee's parties in her backyard. They must have had, they had them on a regular basis. I mean, I think they had them probably monthly. And um, this was always a big deal. So when we started there uh, at the church, the music department and the music uh, that we had on Sundays was really, really an important part of it. Uh, David Rupert was the choir director. He, was, he could sing four octaves himself. He could sing all four parts. Beautiful voice, and he sang with several of the other, would sing with duets and so on. Carol Rupert was the, um, worked in the office at that time, and she was the one that was the head of the youth group, the older, like teenagers, not the younger ones. And um, there was a peace, a youth peace conference in the Soviet Union, and we had a group of, of teenagers that went with Carol to the Soviet Union for that. As I understand, the Harmony Circle started way back when Reverend Reed was um, the minister, you know, from these women that really were the beginnings of the church. And they continued to um, be the money raisers, you know. They were the ones that had the rummage sales, they were the ones that did all the money-making activities. Um, I believe they even did bingo. Um, at the, in this building, I think it was through the Harmony Circle. They all got together, I think at least once a month for lunch. I went to several of those lunches that they'd have in the building. So, um, so they, were, they were really important um, part of the church.
So Reverend Robert Jackson uh, came somewhere about 1980 or so, uh, and we had been going to the church, you know, three or four years, I suspect, before that. And he came with the understanding, I think, that he was going to be assistant minister for, for one or two years or whatever, and then uh, Elizabeth was going to retire. So he was, uh, he was a, I liked him as an assistant minister because I think one of his main strengths was his contact with people and working with them and, and doing uh, workshops and, and, uh, and uh, prayer uh, assisting and so on, and he really was good with people, and people liked him real well. It was not big, it was a small church and a fairly small congregation. The actual membership was maybe 200, and the Sunday attendance was maybe 90. I particularly enjoyed the what I'd call the pastor role taking care of the, the flock, talking to people in my office, one-on-one, -on -one and that sort of thing. Personally, he was real important to me because when I had a, a, a potentially life-threatening uh, illness that occurred that I, uh, I underwent operation for, uh, he was really helpful with me to understand the how to use the principles and, to, and supporting me in that. And uh, that I feel it was a great part of the fact that uh, now at uh, 25 years since, since then, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm free of, of, uh, of the cancer I had then. The fun time was Sunday morning after the service. And we'd all, we'd all go back in the back room and have something to eat and have coffee and talk. Yeah, he was great. I mean, um, he and Joey, his wife, were very personable, very welcoming, very, um, you know, big hearts. <laughs> it, was a, it was a fine group of people. I enjoyed that. And I was there on Pennsylvania Avenue for about 10 years. Mary Louise Ruffner, Reverend Ruffner, candidated after Bob Jackson or before Bob Jackson um, retired. Um, and he was after uh, Reverend Reed. Um, and everybody fell in love with her the minute she came. And it was, you know, it was, a, it was a slam dunk as far as I was concerned. She was humorous. She was to the point. She talked to you, she talked to me, she talked to the next person. Everybody had their own story and their own life, but she touched on it. She told stories and, and brought the teachings into, into a reality very, very much the same as Dr. Reed did. It was about 1987, and there was a situation in my life where I, my, a very good friend knew I needed support and asked me to go to First Church of Religious Science on Pennsylvania Avenue. And about the first five or six weeks, I just, the tears came so easily, and I almost sobbed. It was, it was such a release, and I knew that I had come home spiritually. Mary Louise had a beautiful ability to speak with you and you knew that you were the only one in the room. Her eyes, her body, her energy was with the person with whom she was speaking. And she spoke and she lived principle. Yeah, Reverend Ruffner was a wonderful, wonderful minister and it was during that time that I started actually taking classes. I hadn't taken classes up until that point. And um, so when I took foundations, a third of it was taught by Reverend Ruffner, a third by Deborah Johnson, and a third by um, Reverend Jackson. 
so that to make up the whole foundations class. So that was kind of when I started um, taking classes. So we put the property up for sale and when we decided that we were going to do that move, Cecil and a crew of men took all the stained glass windows out of that church and we stored them somewhere so that when we found our new place we would have our stained glass windows. They were made by Cecil and Dorothy Brucey. And then we rented, we sold the property then so we had nowhere to go and we rented Pacific Cultural Center for a while and then we found this property. This property, you opened the doors and you wanted to turn around and leave. It was, why are we even thinking about it? Then we got our heads together and made some sort of a good financial deal. Um, found out that the property next door belonged to the, the city or the county, so that if anything ever was built there, it would be built hopefully like a park or something like that, and enhance what we had. I mean, I think we had a meeting of the congregation inside the building before we actually um, made the formal offer so that the congregation could, you know, say, okay, this is what it looks like, you know, are you guys ready to <laughs> tackle this big project? And we started cleaning and scrubbing. We got committees, again, almost everybody in the church that could volunteer to do something, painting, cleaning, taking the old pews out, getting rid of them, selling them for something, finding new pews, bringing them in, cleaning them up. Um, I, again, I did, I was, I guess you would call me project manager. The kitchen was so fun to design and I really got a kick out of doing that. But one of our beloved parishioners passed away and left her home to Marcella Wainwright, who sold it and with the proceeds, or a lot of the proceeds, donated the money to pay for most of the kitchen. Getting a committee together to work here to clean this place up, um, Thinking back on that, I get chills and goosebumps and tears because it brought us together as a community once again. Um, it was fun. It was hard work. We had people outside cutting down weeds. We had people inside scrubbing and cleaning. And there was an old house in the front of this building that was cleaned up so that the Harmony Circle ladies could go in there and fix lunch for us every single work day. Well, Eve was one of the founders of the church and she loved this church as much as she loved her life and it was her life. And one of the things that she wanted when we moved over here was to someday see a garden here, landscaping, beautiful flowers, and she loved to garden, and it was her wish that there someday be a meditation garden or just a garden dedicated to her. And I understand that there's even a plaque now, and she would be so thrilled, and she probably is thrilled to know that that's there for her, and that she'll always be remembered, always be remembered. What was it like when we finished all the interior decorations and all the refurbishing and everything was like it was in the drawings that were made and we came down the aisle the first Sunday? It was a feeling that can't be really described in words because it was just bigger than all of us. It was awesome. It was goosebumply, it was teary-eyed, it was just remarkable. It was, it was a manifestation, it was a demonstration of everything that we had put into, um, into word and into action because nothing happens if you don't move your feet and do something. 
and it was just beautiful. It was just so exciting to see the change. I mean, everything was, you know, painted and clean, and it was just wonderful, yeah. Quite an accomplishment. So while I was uh, on the board and uh, part of the church, Mary Louise decided we needed to have um, a retreat for church members, anyone who wanted to come. Uh, they had to pay the expense. And then we got the, the big Victorian there on West Cliff. And uh, I can't remember how many people we had there, but the house was full. And uh, they, they stayed overnight. I remember in the women's room, there was some um, great discussion. Uh, who gets to shower in the morning and who gets to shower at night? <laughs> and, and everybody was just sleeping in big dorm rooms. And then we had huge classrooms. It was really a fun time. I catered the event, so I missed some of the classroom stuff. But I got so much out of just being in that and doing that, being in service the laws of science of mind work, seeing how it worked in my life, taking me from someone who was um, terrified and not supporting herself to someone who bought her own home, had a great job, had a lot of friends, and that's the part of this church that I remember the best, the church and the friendships that I made here, and uh, Mary Louise was, Mary Louise Ruffner was minister, she and I were really good friends. I recall her last sermon and the, um, we were completely almost, completely almost full. And I remember Reverend Ruffner saying, where have you all been? And whereas it was glorious that everyone was there, it was a little sad that it had not been that full every Sunday. After Mary Louise left, we um, had practitioners who were our speakers, uh, including uh, Patrice, um, including Deborah Johnson, um, including people from different churches around. Um, we had people from San Jose come over. Um, Deborah Johnson was probably the most dynamic speaker that we had. She. Her, her background was speaking, diversity speaking, and she went all around the, the country as a, as a speaker, so she knew how to speak. And she was in training to be, I think she was a practitioner. She was thinking about going further and in going into the ministry, but she hadn't made up her mind yet. And when she spoke, our sanctuary was full, always full standing room only. The time between ministers, when we had practitioners speaking and guest speakers from other churches and then candidates speaking, <clears throat> I think was a time when everybody pulled together, um, enjoyed hearing different people speak, and felt that the best kept secret in the universe <laughs> needed to keep going. I'm pretty sure that each time was a similar feeling among the congregation. Sand, Sandy could be on the front of Vogue. Sandy was all glam. And uh, um, that, she was all glam. Reverend Sandy, she came uh, when I was having a lot of personal problems. My husband had had cancer and it was uh, really rather bleak and she was just so supportive of us. She uh, would call me, she'd send me notes and uh, in uh, December she was leaving for Tahoe for a friend's wedding. She wasn't the performing the cer ceremony but she went on vacation and my husband was really not doing well and every day he'd say is the minister back yet is the minister back yet he did not want to go until i had the support of her being here and available to help me you know he just uh, he really really enjoyed her as much as i did i don't know what i'd have done without her
I think with Reverend Sandy, she was a real wonderful, warm, hugging person. And, you know, that kind of, there was that kind of cultural change. We um, got rid of most of the pews and put in the chairs. And that's the first time that we were able to really clear the chairs off the um, floor so that we could have some events, I think. We had a dance there one time, which everybody was just like, oh my gosh, should we do this in the sanctuary? <laughs> well, Carol Carr is, is probably one of my favorite uh, uh, people for giving us a, a inspiring and appropriate uh, service. She's a really good speaker, a lot of energy, and, and she's got a good sense of humor too. What I remember about Carol is one of the many memories is her profound ability to to speak principle to put out science of mind philosophy and i remember i to this day would consider reverend carol carnes one of the finest pulpit ministers i've ever heard i would almost put her with a caliber with a, Reverend Michael Beckwith. She's excellent on the dais. You know, it's like we had just moved into the 21st century. So she was really into the 21st century and we're gonna be more modernized in our, our, our look and everything is going to reflect that rather than way back, you know, when the church first started. So that's when she, um, wanted to change the name to upgrade it a little bit because we were called the First Church of Religious Science and she wanted it to be more something that was more marketable. And so we had lots of names suggested and we had a big meeting and we voted on what name and I can't even remember all the other names. We had other names and we came up with the Center for Conscious Living. And, um, you know, and that was great. I mean, I thought that was a, you know, it was a great move. She just changed the whole look of the platform. You know, she, she was the one that had them design that curved background with the words. I think she probably picked all the words that were on there. They also redid the foyer. Um, that was all done during her time. You know, just to make it look more inviting, more up to date for people that came. During Carol Carnes' ministry, the exterior, the landscaping, the place was completely renovated outside and that I give much gratitude to Dr. Dar Birch for heading that up and everyone who came and, uh, and gave service for that. In addition, the front door was painted red and I, as I recall that had to do with prosperity and abundance and I have forever liked that. I thought that was a, a wonderful idea. And the garden happened during her time. I mean, that was just monumental, you know. Um, this garden, that fence was not there, obviously, when we bought the property. So Dar was really the one that spearheaded that whole thing. And lots of people participated in building the fence, the platform, planning everything, yeah. Yes, I was on the board with Carol. And that was exciting. I believe that was my second time on the Board of Trustees here, and that's always an honor. It was warm and friendly and could be verbally combative, and it was spiritual, and it was ecclesiastical, and it was a little aggressive at times. And as Jim Babcock would say, it was all good all the time. So Carol Carnes turned me on to Science of Mind. She was really my very first teacher. Uh, I walked through the door and I was just astounded at the articulate way that she expresses the teachings of Ernest Holmes. I just felt so blessed that someplace like this existed. And when I would hear her talk, I wanted the whole place to be full. 
Carol was uh, active really on a national platform. She was in the leadership of the Association for Global New Thought. So she was uh, meeting with Michael Beckwith, she was uh, meeting with the Dalai Lama, she was going to all these important meetings, and she brought that sensibility to the center. So Carol likes to party, and we had a lot of great parties when Carol was minister. After Carol left, we had about two years of uh, guest speakers while we were looking for a new minister. And we hired Reverend Angela in 2007, and she served as our minister until 2012. Uh, during that time, we had a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, Angela enjoyed uh, more ritual and ceremony, and so we incorporated that more into our service. Angela's husband, Sonny, was also a big part of the Sunday service. He did a lot of the music. And the music has always been really important to us at CSL. We've always had great music, and uh, we've had, always had a choir and a, a house band, and it's always added a lot to our Sunday service. During Angela's ministry, we changed the name of our center to the Center for Spiritual Living. And we did this because the home church was really wanting to develop a brand for all of the spiritual centers. They wanted people to be able to recognize a center for spiritual living. And we thought it was a good idea. So we went along and we changed our name to the Center for Spiritual Living Santa Cruz. The practitioners were uh, a very cohesive group during that time and we had the Spiritual Dinner Theater. I think we had probably four uh, productions of Spiritual Dinner Theater. <laughs> that Angela left, we formed a group called the Movers and the Shakers. And the Movers and the Shakers was a group that was kind of a booster club to the center. It was kind of like what Harmony Circle had been in the old days, except we had everybody. Everybody was welcome. We had men, we have men and women in the Movers and Shakers. And it's really a group that sponsors events, that gets uh, reports about what's happening at the church, that really supports uh, the life of the church by raising money and by really uh, getting communication throughout the center. So we've done a lot of great things. We've sponsored some wonderful events, some wonderful dinners that Rick has been the cook for. We've done uh, a spiritual cinema, cinema at the center we call it, and that's been a great event. The Movers and Shakers is just a group you can count on to support the activities of the center. So as a community, we're always moving forward. And whether we have a minister or not, we move forward. And these past few years, we've really made a lot of progress in terms of our uh, electronic profile. We have a wonderful e-news uh, that LB does, and people open it and they stay connected with the community. We have a great new website that's really user-friendly, that uh, tells people all about us and we also have uh, a page on Facebook so we're really with it and we're reaching out to the community we're helping people find us I find it interesting to have uh, different speakers all the time especially since I did spend many years listening to one person it's uh, really different but also kind of wonderful you know, it, it's nice to know there are people that are going to be here all the time, even if they're not a minister. Practitioners are great, too. <laughs>
Well, other churches tell you what to think. And we like to tell people how to think. I think there's a big difference there. Of course, you know, once you have science of mind, you never forget it. And I use it all the time. I take the, the magazine and every night of the world, I read the, the daily word or whatever you call it. It's a comfort to me, and uh, not only a comfort, but uh, something I can, it upholds me all the time. I'm, uh, and I don't think I could get that from any other church. Life is all about choices, and this teaching teaches that. There is no devil that made you do it. There is no, no God that's judging you. It's all about your choices and how you apply them in your life. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. This teaching has meant, not to my life, but this teaching has meant my life. It is what keeps me here. Um, you know, I think it was sort of a catalyst for just my own personal development and spiritual development. And it has meant everything to me in my life. Um, it has helped me with raising my children. Uh, my, I have a very good marriage, and I believe a lot of that is due to religious science principles being practiced um, in our home and to the best of our ability. It has just been my life, and it has gotten me through some really rough patches, um, a lot of um, anxiety issues I've had in my life, and just in dealing with life in general, even, even when I kind of just fall off the wagon, as they say, and I forget everything I've ever learned, something always brings me back to that center. I am here for the fellowship. I, I do all the reading at home. I've read all the recommended books that there are, and uh, I can do that at home, and I still do, but I love to come here for the people the connection, the tribe, <laughs> and it's foremost in my life. One of the highlights of this center, I believe, is community. There is truly a liking and a joy when the groups in the social hall, for instance, after service are gathering. And generally, this is a center that enjoys uh, social, I, I think now we're actually getting more people to social events than we used to in the past. So uh, that's very inspiring and it, uh, it will work, work well to assist in more community and benefit financially, of course, our center. It's an energy that says this, there is a place for this philosophy, for this energy, for this community that, that resonates with enough people that, uh, that, that it uh, will continue to have, uh, to have a place to do so. I am so very grateful this center is here and I want to do everything I can to support it. Um, financially, emotionally, whatever it takes to keep it going. This teaching fit like a velvet glove when I first came into it and like many other people said that they felt like they had come home. But it gave me the tools to get through a single life without my kids at, and without a partner for all these years. And it's been, what, 40 some odd years. And I think I've done pretty well. I just feel like I've been very blessed to have known the ministers starting with Dr. Reed all the way through today. And um, they were all wonderful. And, you know, they all had their special, special talents. The teaching for me began, as I said, in 1987 with tears, tears of joy and a coming home sense. The teachings today are teachings that 
that give me smiles, that give me a passion for each and every day, different than it used to be. Uh, in these 27 years that I've been attending this center, I, there have been many profound and devastating moments with losses and such. And without these teachings, I might not be so as centered as I am. I might not be as joyful as I am. I, my glass perhaps would not be half full as it is now. So I'm grateful to Ernest Holmes. I'm grateful to every minister who has been on that dais because I have learned and grown with every minister. I'm grateful for all of the spiritual books that I've read that this philosophy has pointed me toward. And I'm, I, I just know that I am a richer person for all of this. I've been a spiritual seeker all of my life. And to me, science of mind has been the most helpful of anything that I have found. It has the biggest perspective, the biggest, widest, universal perspective. And it's also transformation at the most basic level of a pattern of thought. To me, this is just a powerful teaching. And I feel so good about sharing this teaching with more and more people. From what I learned at Science of Mind, I wouldn't be able to live in this house alone without the feeling that God and I are one. I just love the principles of it. The, the idea of oneness, uh, the idea of mental control, everything is the mind is so important and so, so powerful. Attitude can change almost anything. That's the power of mind. Have you read Ernest Holmes? <laughs>